make sure that's working properly. All right, so we are currently live and streaming on YouTube, which means we're going to kick off the meeting now. Got a few more people to let in. Um, but thank you all for coming out to e-conference number 11 today. Uh, today is Introduction to Open Space and a couple of our recurring segments. So really excited that you're, you're joining us. Um, next week, just to give everybody a heads up, we're going to have uh, two additional kind of special sessions. Uh, the first session on Wednesday is going to focus on social media. So not necessarily on the content we've been creating, but how best to use things like Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, sort of instead of the 20 and 30 minute stuff, it's the two and three minute stuff. Uh, and so we'll have a little panel discussion, got a few people that were calling in favors from, uh, they're going to come help us out and, uh, and give us sort of an overview of that. And then Friday... <laughs> Um, it's what happens when a five-year-old plays Mario Kart behind you. Um, so adorable. Uh, on Friday, because we've been seeing a lot of the the open um, the opening of states and sort of the for the preparation for returning to domes at some point in the near future, uh, we're going to hold a uh, uh, almost certainly a session-long discussion on what you're doing at your facilities, what it's like in your states, in your countries. Um, we'll probably do sort of a, a Carrie Berglund lips style, let's just put paper on the wall and start taking notes uh, and just try to compile in one place as much information as possible about what sites are doing in, in preparing uh, but also not just in the short term in the sort of the one, two, three months, but how we're looking forward maybe six months or even a year, what it would look like as we're working towards the vaccine or post vaccine or, you know, what conferences might look like in the future. Uh, and so that'll be a, a good opportunity to get everybody in one place and, and discuss that. So um, that's what we'll be focusing on in next week's e-conferences. But for today, uh, we have a very special guest all the way from San Francisco. He's, um, uh, the manager of planetary technologies over at the Morrison Planetarium, California Academy of Sciences. We have Dan Tell here today, uh, who's going to be giving us an introduction to open space. Uh, and then we have a few recurring segments, um, seemingly everyone's favorite long German words of the week uh, with Anna Green. We have an episode of The Record Shop with Mike Smale. We're going to go back to the artist corner this week with Jackie Bauman. Uh, essentially what we're going to be doing is... Jackie Bauman from Buffalo. Um, Ben's really excited. Uh, sort of a, a Photoshop and Illustrator tool of the week, sort of a tip that you can use uh, that is very, very useful to come back to once you'll take one of Jackie's intro tutorials uh, that we'll be putting together uh, over the next couple of weeks. Uh, and then we've got Mary Holt with a, a another uh, episode of her uh, podcasts and then open forum at the end of it. But since we wanted to give Dan as much time as possible, we know that there's going to be a lot of questions about open space uh, and its utilization. Remember, of course, that the group chat is the primary means by which we will be taking questions. Uh, I'll be watching that the whole time. So please feel free to let us know um, what you want to hear and we can get that to Dan. And again, if you're in the participants window, feel free to raise your hand and that'll queue you up as well. So without further ado, um, let's give Dan his proper introduction. Dan Tell manages the technologies powering Morrison Planetarium, Hofeld Hall, and other immersive venues at the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco. Dan also manages data and content integration of the Academy's real-time software systems. And he has a hand in hundreds of live shows, lectures, events, and external collaborations. Dan has been a significant contributor to the Uniview user group and contributes to the Academy's role as an informal science institution partner on the Open Space Project. Um, you may know Dan from such planetariums as the Roger B. Chafee Planetarium, the Grand Rapids Public Museum in Grand Rapids, Michigan, uh, where he worked starting in 2003, joined the Academy in 2012, uh, he was also one of the planners for the 2017 March for Science in San Francisco. And on top of all of that, not only is he currently the president-elect for the Great Lakes Planetarium Association, but he's Maya's dad. So without further ado, everyone, Dan Tell. Uh, hi, everyone. It's really good to see everyone again. Uh, to Michael's last point of bio, um, yeah, I haven't been 
as many of these conferences as I would like because I'm basically full-time parenting like right now. Um, my wife, for those who don't know, works in municipal uh, government budgeting. And as you might imagine, things look really bad right now. So she's really busy. I spend a lot of time um, full-time parenting. So it's really great to see everybody and have a few hours uh, to spend with you and hopefully share some useful information. Um, this uh, Doing this tutorial was sort of born out of helping Michael directly set up open space. Um, but also I, I probably helped a handful of people get started with open space um, in the last few months. Um, I don't wanna be like, I am the great expert in open space and there's already a lot of existing resources and tutorials out there, but I've done a lot, um, clear, I've gotten a lot of questions from friends um, and a lot of questions would be so much easier if I could just show people how I have open space set up and how to set it up. Uh, but since I've been at home taking care of the baby, I don't have my like typical workstation uh, in front of me. So I'm, I am at the academy today. I'm, I've got my, my mask for getting around. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I wanna go through some of the basic steps of setting up open space. Some of the most common questions I've gotten from people that I've helped set up open space, um, direct you to some resources that can use it uh, and give you like the very basics from just getting the install going up to hopefully some of the more intermediate stuff of um, how you can configure open space well for streaming um, and use it as a tool to augment your existing software packages. Uh, so obviously open space is a um, collaborative project between the American Museum of Natural History and Linköping University in uh, Sweden. Um, that might be a familiar uh, synergy that you might have heard of before on another software project. Um, but unlike that previous project, open space is intended to be an open source project. Uh, it is partly funded through a NASA Science Mission Directorate grant um, to expand it as a tool for visualizing NASA's SMD missions. Um, and yeah, I, I think maybe that's enough background to just start diving in. Uh, so there's gonna be a lot of screen sharing going on. And um, obviously in like some of the previous ones I've sat in, uh, when it comes to screen sharing, uh, let me sh shuffle my windows a little bit so things aren't so easy. On the spatial resolution of my screen share. Um, so things might look a little stuttery, um, but I wanna, hopefully send you as much resolution as possible as so you can see the details of where I'm looking in file trees and menus and things like that. Um, I am on a 4K monitor too, which is probably gonna additionally hamper this stream, but hopefully you can like read some of the text on my screen right now. Um, so I've got the open space website app uh, and I just wanna start with literally, how do you download and install open space? Um, well, I, so first of all, uh, if you Google open space, you probably won't get open space first. Um, <laughs> just type open space into Google. You got a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, I guess it's like the fourth result. Um, um, and so yeah, open space project uh, and openspaceproject.com is where open space lives. Uh, so one great tip just for actually finding the right program and not getting caught up in any of these other things that have been branded open space in the past. Uh, da, da, da. So once you're on the open space site, you can download open space. Um, one thing that is worth warning you about and is a problem I've encountered both with some members of my own team and a couple of other people that have helped is uh, the current release of open space is beta version six, version 0.15.1. Version 0.15.1 is the first version of open space that um, makes use, of, well, it has the code in there. It doesn't fully make use of it yet. Uh, it has the code in there for Windows 10 touchscreen compatibility. Uh, as you might know, if you are a Windows user, Windows 10 has enhanced touchscreen features over previous builds of Windows, which means if you download 0.15.1, it will not work on uh, Windows 7 or below. This is something that has caught several people up because it is not noted or documented anywhere. Um, so if you want to use, an, uh, if you have an older OS, if you have Windows 7, um, I doubt it would even work on XP <laughs> or hopefully on Vista. Um, but if you're using an older version of Windows, you'll need to go to the installation page and download an older version. Um, version 15.0 does not have those touch application controls built in yet. So it will still run on Windows 7, 15.1, um, Windows 8 and up. Um, so just a, a really good thing to keep in mind that is not otherwise documented um, and good to know. <laughs> uh, there are, uh, open space is also built for both Windows and Mac OS. Um, I haven't done a lot with the Mac OS build because it also requires, I wanna say High Sierra and above. And um, we do have Macs here at the Academy, but uh, in the case of myself, my Macintosh runs an older version of Mac OS. 
uh, basically for compatibility with some of the other rendering um, environment that we have here at the Academy. Our render farm is all on Linux, but um, yeah, for certain compatibility things, I'm on an older version of Mac OS. So I've never been able to actually test it on Mac OS. Uh, definitely not an expert on how to use that, um, but Windows certainly available. But try them both out. Uh, if you have a Mac, um, they should be functionally identical. Um, and hopefully the, the sort of the basic tips I will give you here will still carry over between the two. Um, also, if you're downloading onto Windows, uh, there's a note directly under the installer that you should make sure you have the latest or the 2019 Microsoft Visual C++ redistributed package. Um, you know, download the right one for your OS, 32-bit or 64-bit. Uh, this is another thing that's important with 0 0.15.1. Um, for 15.0 and earlier, they use the uh, 2015 Visual C++ redistributable. Um, but there is some new stuff in there that calls the 2019 C++ redistributable. So um, just make sure, download it, make sure you're up to date, make sure you have the latest um, C++, otherwise open space just won't run at all. Something else that is worth downloading too are these optional planetary data sets. Um, if you download all of these plus open space, you're gonna probably wanna put it on a hard drive that has at least hundred gigabytes of free space, um, which is hopefully not like um, impossible for you. Uh, <laughs> I mean, my hard drive is like constantly uh, a battle to keep any free space on it at all. Um, but yeah, definitely make sure you have enough space for lots of data um, because these are fairly big map data tile sets. And that's something I want to dive into a bunch with open space. Um, and part of what I think is like really, really cool with open space. Um, I don't think open space is here to replace any of the existing planetarium software packages right now. Um, and I, I don't think that's the goal of open space either. You know, there's still room in the marketplace for Digistar and, um, well, I mean, <laughs> uh, Zeiss Uniview, um, uh, dark matter and other um, existing planetarium software packages. This does not replace any of those, um, but it does some cool things that are not fully or smoothly implemented in those packages. Um, and hopefully is an example of something that is leading the way in our industry, as well as of course, the very nature of being open source software. Um, you know, it's software that a community of users can contribute to and edit and build into something that meets the needs and desires that we want. Um, and I think the, one of the strongest things it does there is making use of high resolution planetary map data, uh, which is something I've been like obsessed with for years. <laughs> um, we do a lot of programs using planetary map data at the California Academy of Sciences. It's something I, I, I try to encourage a lot of Univ users because Univ had those functionalities for many years to make use of. Um, and I think it's something that through open space now, all of us can make use of. Uh, to think about and present programs in a very different way than we might have done before um, and explore the universe in what I think is a much more tactile, experiential, meaningful way um, of making these, these celestial bodies not just points of light in the sky, but actual worlds that we can visit and stand on and take our audiences to, whether it be through a live stream program or in your planetarium dome. Um, so yeah, recommend downloading everything because that's that's how you really are going to get the most out of open space. Uh, and then just a little note on how to install it and sort of have a folder set up. Uh, and this is something I've spent a lot of time like <laughs> talking people through on like text messages or something like that. Uh, when if like I could just show everyone screenshots, it would be so much easier. Um, oh, before I actually jump into that, there are also like under the resources tab on the open space website, there are tutorial videos with Carter. Um, like I said, this is my mask. I'm not trying to just Carter channel Carter with a scarf. Um, but yeah, you can watch videos with Carter. Uh, they are a little out of date though. Um, they are still helpful, but some of the shortcuts for the interface have changed. Um, so they're worth watching, they're worth referencing, um, but if you get frustrated because something doesn't seem to work right, it's probably because something changed and might not have, and these videos are a couple years old. Um, there's also a user guide, um, some basic add-ons, and uh, I don't know if it's linked to from here. Oh yeah, yeah it, it is linked to under support. Um, there's also the open space wiki, uh, which is fairly incomplete, but it does contain some documentation for how to convert data. Um, and so sort of like uh, one of the most important things I would reference in here is um, creating new map data that open space can read because uh, you, know, you only saw there was moon, Mars, Mercury as built-in downloads. Um, but as you might know, we have very high resolution planetary data for lots of objects in our solar system now. Um, and so that's one of the things I've spent a lot of time here doing at the Academy is expanding the data that we have. Um, 
And so I would recommend uh, if you've never tried it out before, like uh, it's good to familiarize, familiarize yourself with GDAO, the Geodata Abstraction Library, um, which is an open source library for manipulating um, GIS data. Uh, there's also QGIS or Quantum GIS, uh, which is basically like a GUI interface for doing the same thing. It's sort of like an open source version of the Esri um, GIS software package. Um, I, I, I'm not going to go into those in detail, um, but they're really useful things to know about. Hopefully I'm not frozen. My, is my video frozen? We can still hear me, right? Okay. <laughs> All right, just the video's frozen. Um, oh, I see, it dumped my virtual background. Um, yeah, so both of these are really useful tools to familiarize yourself with. They would be like deep, lengthy tutorials in and of themselves. So I'm not going to dive into them. Um, but uh, if there are, they are additional things that uh, can have benefit if you want to spend some time learning. Um, or you can just like email me and I'll, I'll send you stuff. Uh, <laughs> uh, so to dive into open space installation, um, I've got like a freshly downloaded zip file of open space here. Um, but uh, I've got a folder set up and I would recommend setting up a folder structure somewhat like this, because this is gonna be what open space expects. So I've created a directory somewhere called open space. Um, because I'm lazy, it is on my desktop for me. Um, uh, but I do have my desktop sort of synchronized. So it's on my basically large data storage drive. So it's like, you know, I have like a fast SSD for booting up and OS and then all my data is on a slow drive. And so I have open space on the slow drive because it's where the space is. Um, so I made a folder called open space. Uh, and if you open the zip, I'm not gonna like fully unzip it. Um, you know, you'll have the folder with open space in here and it's a flat directory beneath the first folder. Um, that's kind of what you want. So you want to, you know, just drag your install into your open space folder. Um, I'm not going to do that right now because I don't need to do that. Uh, and it'll live there like that, um, flat directory. And then you also want to make in that folder a folder called open space data, all one word. Open space data is where those high resolution map data files are going to live. Uh, so once again, you would download, unzip those, and they should be flat directories. So they should look like you're going to open space data, Mars, and then the subdirectories. Uh, you basically, you don't have it like Mars, Mars, then the subdirectory is just Mars subdirectories. Um, same for moon, uh, in this case, flat directory. Um, yeah, so I think that's the key thing about setting up your install is you have to build this open space data folder yourself, populate it and populate it in a way that open space is going to expect to read. Um, you can edit the file that it uses to reference and read this data. Uh, and I will show you where that file is if you do want to store your open space data elsewhere. Um, but this will be the easiest way to get you started and have open space just reading files where we'd expect to find them. Um, so I, I actually have several builds of open space here. We've been working with open space at the Academy for about five years, um, but we haven't really, it's only been in the last two ish years, we've been really intensively digging into it. So, you know, we, we've been part of like the partnership for the um, the New Horizons Flyby of Pluto is one of the first sort of public group visualizations uh, projects done through open space. Um, it's been used then since then for several other projects, including Dawn mission visualization, Juno visualization. Um, it's the only planetarium software I'm aware of currently that can support large volumes of the Gaia data. Uh, and so we actually did a lecture last year with um, Jackie Barrity from AMNH. Um, who does a ton of the research into Gaia and showcasing some of the amazing stories that can be taken out of Gaia and told with Gaia. Um, and yeah, open space can run uh, you know, millions and millions of the stars in Gaia with their proper motions and, and full data. Um, really cool for those things. And uh, starting, trying to wind back. Uh, yeah, yeah, starting about two years ago, we first did a lecture on um, in our lead up to the Apollo 50th anniversary celebrations. Uh, using open space to visualize moon terrain and data and the history of the Apollo missions. Uh, we then sort of took a portable install of open space out to the USS Hornet, which is docked in Alameda, where they keep the nuclear vessels across the bay. Um, we did a tour of the moon there using open space. And since then, we've actually been using open space as a daily program at Morrison Planetarium, obviously not for the last almost two months, um, since there have been no daily programs in the last two months. Um, but yeah, uh, we're using a lot of open space here at Morrison and we've been adapting it to meet our needs. And so we've been going through, you know, several beta builds um, <laughs> because of course uh, the software itself is still very nascent, 
uh, and we are still progressing as the software develops and adds new features and enables us to tell more and more of the stories that we want. Um, so I've got several installs here, all living together happily in my open space folder. Um, so, you, you know, most likely you would only have one. Um, <laughs> your directory shouldn't look like that. Uh, but what I'm going to show you a little bit mix of is I have sort of both a custom install that I've made a bunch of modifications of, and I have like a basic bare bones install that would be exactly the way that you download it from the open space website. Um, so I'm in this one open space 15.1b that's uh, exactly as open space will come to you downloaded from the website. Um, and then just to navigate a couple of the other folders in here that will be of use. Um, so in this base folder, uh, you know, there's some basic information, but one of the most important files here is the open space configuration file. Um, you probably will not need to change anything with this, uh, but it will be worth keeping in mind um, when you get back into your planetarium, if you want to install open space on your cluster, you will need to do a little bit of modification in this file. Because um, the start point of this file points to various configurations that you can use. Um, but if you're using this on a single workstation, you won't really need to dive into this file at all. Um, but basically what this is doing, it's telling me open space's default configuration, in my case, just a window, um, the default scene that it loads. And there's several, uh, some confusion between like asset and scene, but yeah, this is basically telling you the asset group that open space is loading with all the other ones commented out um, and then where to find its directories and things like that. So it knows the directories. Um, yeah, that, that covers sort of the basics of that. Um, just good to know where that file is. Um, in the bin folder is the open space program itself. So this is definitely something I've seen confuse a handful of other people is you don't actually need to install open space. Um, basically it's a completely self-contained package. All you have to do is unzip it. And then the open space.exe program is in there. So don't let yourself get thrown off of like, well, how do I actually install this? Um, the program lives self-contained in its own directory. It's got all the drivers it needs to reference built into it. Uh, and so you can access open space and launch it from this bin folder without having to do anything else. Um, however, there's a slightly better way to launch open space now. Um, there's also this folder called open space launcher, which contains openspacelauncher.exe. And this is going to give you a nice graphical launcher for open space. Um, there we go. Hopefully it'll come up eventually. Um, and this will sort of let you override that openspace.configuration file. The launcher currently does not work on a cluster though. Um, so if you wanna use the launcher, it only works on a single workstation, but presumably if you're doing streaming programs, that's exactly what you need. And this will let you choose any of the other scenes that you happen to have loaded into open space um, and set different configuration windows, uh, which I'll dive into a little bit of some of those in a little bit, but I just wanna show you the basics of what open space should also look like as it starts up. So if you wanna start from the launcher, um, I'm just gonna start with the default and a regular window, hit start. And I hit it twice, so now it's gonna do it twice. <laughs> but uh, I'll just close one of those. Um, so when open space first, start, first starts launching, it's gonna open a command line window, uh, which is going through basically the launcher log and it's uh, inventory and everything about the software, it's initializing assets. Uh, and if it's the very first time you are downloading open space, um, oh yeah, you should have basically your launcher log and you should have an open space window, which will be blank at first until open space starts to initialize. Um, as it starts to initialize, the second thing it's going to do, and actually this might be might not be a totally um, fresh install, uh, the very first thing you will also see it do is it will start to populate a bunch of little, I'm tapping the screen with my fingers, I have no idea why because you can't see my fingers, but um, it's going to start to populate the screen with a bunch of little um, downloading messages of saying open space is downloading this data set, this data set, this data set, this data set, uh, and populating your install. Um, let me try and launch a different profile so if I can get us to see that. Yeah, deinitialize, come on. Okay. Um, Right, so let that issue. Um, if you don't see either of these windows appear, that's your first guide that something is off. Okay, so now you can see it's starting to download information. Um, Open Space uses sort of a torrent style downloader to synchronize information, sort of make sure everybody has the same install. So it is contacting the Open Space server out there saying, um, the profile says I need this file in it. I don't have this file. Please give me this file. It will download it. That means if you are not connected to the internet 
or if your internet connection blocks certain downloading ports like to prevent piracy, um, you might not be able to download all the open space data. So that's one thing to check. Um, and yeah, also if like these windows just appear and crash, uh, that's a good way to know something else is up with your computer. Um, the most common cause I've seen for this is trying to launch 15.1 on a Windows 7 install. Um, I'm gonna interrupt it while it's downloading right now anyway, because I don't need to download those files. Um, so if, if you use the launcher, it's just crashing, it's worth going into the bin, opening up openspace.exe, seeing if you get any other error pop-up um, that might be preventing OpenSpace from launching. Uh, also, as OpenSpace launches, if you're on Windows 8 or 10, you're going to also get some security warnings uh, because OpenSpace does create a WebSocket for control purposes. Um, so you're gonna get two warnings, one for both uh, OpenSpace itself and one for the node.js, the, the JavaScript that OpenSpace uses for communication. So you're gonna have to click through both of those to allow both of those as well, um, at which point you should be able to run OpenSpace. If you're having other problems with OpenSpace opening up, um, here in the logs, there is this log.html. Um, this is the basically a, a more readable version of that command line window. Because um, obviously that command line window is like spinning by really fast. It's hard to catch an error when it happens in that window. Um, so if you go into the logs, open up the log.html, you can see what was happening in that last load of open space and you can uh, look for look for your errors um, open space is fairly good at reporting where the error occurred if it's with a file um, but hopefully if you do a fresh download from the website you shouldn't have any obvious errors and the biggest things you have to watch out for and worry about are just the actual compatibility issues with your hardware um, open space doesn't currently have published hardware specifications uh, but it's a very GPU intensive program. It's a very sophisticated, fancy, nice um, rendering, high data detailed rendering of our universe and objects within it, which means it is, um, it's gonna use up a lot of your GPU memory. Uh, so it's good to have as powerful a graphics card as you can. Um, I'm running it right now on some kind of Quadro something. Um, might be like a P6000, um, but I have run open space on something as lightweight as like a, a GTX 780 Ti. So, um, you know, the hardware is a fairly big range and the hardware will be, will be affected depending on what you actually want to do with open space and what you try to do with it. Um, we also, we have run it on laptops. It runs more or less okay, depending again on what you do, what things you load into open space um, and how you use them. So those are the basics of getting OpenSpace installed, where to find some key files, um, and now I'll dive a little bit into actually using OpenSpace. So I've got um, an OpenSpace window already open here. Uh, and I think for the moment, let me just uh, share just the OpenSpace screen itself. Okay. Hopefully we have that. Um, so I'm starting us off on Earth. Uh, and if you've downloaded open space, hopefully you've seen some of the basics of this, but I am uh, starting us here in Waimea Canyon in Hawaii, uh, because I'm sure like many of us, I'm getting really, really tired of being trapped at home and I'm desperate to like, <laughs> uh, one day, one day when we can travel again, have a vacation somewhere nice. Um, so I'm gonna fly out of that. Uh, open space has really good default map layers. Um, so at high resolutions, uh, close to the surface of the earth, I believe you're getting um, especially licensed Bing Maps uh, data. Uh, so you can get down to meter per pixel resolution in many parts of the earth with high detail terrain maps. Um, pull back out a little bit. Uh, and yeah, again, this is like just the earth version of like what's so cool about open space is the high resolution map and terrain data. Um, so yeah, let's pull out a little bit further. As I pull out, um, open space's default layers are gonna auto transition from high resolution maps to a more even global data set. I shouldn't say more even. Um, out, do, do, do. Dan, All right, and so. Uh, if we can interrupt for a second, would it be possible for you to reshare your screen uh, since we're looking at sort of um, macro scale? Could you sh have this shared for um, the, the sharing resolution rather than the full resolution we had before? Sorry about that. Oh. Um, yeah, so to share, uh, yeah, spatially. How's that? Definitely a higher frame rate, thanks. Okay, all right, so um, what you're now gonna be seeing is uh, as I have zoomed out, uh, OpenSpace has transitioned to sort of what it's using as the default um, 
global coverage, which is the daily satellite passes from the SOMI MPP satellite. So this is uh, yeah, current daily data coming down from a great satellite orbiting the Earth. Um, SOMI MPP, if you're not familiar, is also the satellite uh, that was used to generate the Black Marble data set. It's a both visual and infrared observatory. Um, and yeah, it generates about a 30 meter per pixel image of the Earth every single day. Uh, when you first launch Open Space by default, it's gonna jump you back in time one day, because of course, if I go to now, the SOMI MPP satellite is orbiting the Earth as we speak, uh, creating noon daily passes. Um, those passes are of course being downloaded and processed by, uh, let's say Goddard does some of the work. Um, and so, yeah, basically this data is coming down live from the satellite and being downloaded to Open Space as it becomes available, which means if you were looking at today, you're looking at an incomplete map of the Earth because SOMI is still in its orbit and still picking up the current passes. Uh, so if I jump back to yesterday, I'll get yesterday. Uh, and similarly, you can also do this for like other like uh, weather visualizations because clouds move, uh, everything is like tracking as time goes on, obviously. And so you can keep winding back through time, downloading older and older patches. Um, and yeah, follow weather news stories and things like that. Like uh, during the Amazon fires, of course, um, I mean, I'm sure there's still fires going on in the Amazon, but the very prominent ones last year, uh, that was one of the things that you could see in this data because it was this daily data coming down. You know, you could drop down on the Amazon, see fires during the Australian wildfires. You could pop over to Australia, see those fires. Um, you know, if there's a major storm or hurricane that is visible. So you're looking at the real daily data of the earth coming down from the satellites. And that's just the default layer that's available in open space. Um, but open space is very powerful in accessibility to other data layers. Uh, again, that's, that's part of I think is its whole power. So open space um, has a few different generations of user interface in it sort of as it's been developed. Uh, I think it still leans very heavily on the developer side of the interface. Um, so it takes a little bit of learning to navigate and find where things are. Um, but uh, your basic interface that you'll get up here, uh, the default GUI, as we would call it now, which won't work unless you enable those web sockets either. Um, you'll have uh, this little button for a couple extra things like a, um, a command console, things like that. Um, but scene is where most of the things you'll want to access are. And so scene will automatically load you up with an object tree like this. Um, and we'll also keep whatever your current focus is, current focus being whatever object you're targeted to up top, so you can directly access that object settings. And a lot of what we're gonna see, there's a lot of settings you like don't even need to worry about, because again, they're still like very development oriented. Um, but layers uh, is where you're gonna like dive into to see a lot of the other layers that are available. So we're looking at the Esri Veers combo. So the Esri Veers combo, the combination of the, the Esri global map with that Veers, the SUMI MPP layers on top of it. Um, but you know, there's like, there's other maps <laughs> available, just uh, straight up downloadable um, built into open space that you can just slap on top. Um, none of these might be like immediately illustrative. Uh, da -da. Um, but yeah, uh, this is an example of like, yeah, uh, where you can access these. And also, if you have the API to access other web map service layers, um, you can open basically the traditional or the, the, the old open space GUI with F1 um, and go onto globe browsing under the open space GUI. Uh, and this will give you a window where you can talk to, I'm talking to the NASA Gibbs um, server, uh, which lets you download additional layers. So you're going to do it for me. Again, maybe I select a layer that doesn't have a lot of useful information or data on it, but um, it's an example of where you can get additional data. And so anything where you can access, um, yeah, basically a WMS uh, or WTMS API uh, to download in high resolution map files and NASA, NOAA, um, many government agencies have excellent databases of such files. You can enhance your experience of open space and download in any, any data that will tell your climate stories that you're interested in, climate or, or planetary science stories. Um, let me see if I can, one that might work. Uh, 
that is such as it is. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, I didn't have a lot of time to set up and, and pick the perfect layer to show this. Um, but now that I've shown that, uh, I want to leave the earth and show some of the other things that make open space really cool. And part of that is its ability to like move between scales and the layer of detail and scale that has been built into open space. Um, so I'm using a special profile that we prepared for another event. Um, I don't know what's happening. I have that interface in the same place. Um, but I'm going to move us over to our friendly neighbor in space, the moon. Um, and show an example of how uh, we can move from macro scale to human scale in open space, um, which of course is ideally something we're all familiar with from any planetarium software. But I think open space, it really helps us bridge the gap between that planetary scale and a human appreciable scale. So here I am with the moon. Um, once again, uh, if I jump into my scene, uh, there's a lot of data layers you can access for the moon. Um, so these ones that are on servers, I'm going to turn off my local layer, naked moon. Um, these ones with the bracketed information behind them, these are web map services. I'll get to that, John. <laughs> uh, I, saw, I saw John just ask a question on how you actually focus on new objects. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, you can see there's a list of uh, ones that are being hosted through the open space um, partner servers. So there's a server at University of Utah, there's a server in Sweden. Um, and by selecting these, you should be able to directly download these map data files um, and start to here they come in um, and have your sort of initial library of things you can explore with open space. Um, if you download the additional map data, let me turn back on what I was using. Um, downloading the additional map data from the website is going to give you a bunch of these Apollo patches. Um, so the base lunar layer is the um, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter's wide angle camera, um, which is about 100 meters per pixel resolution on the moon. So just by default, your base data for the moon is 100 meters per pixel, which is really cool as is. Like you can really zoom in, see a lot of great features. Um, and of course, also have really good terrain detail. Uh, this is non-exaggerated high resolution terrain. Um, and uh, you might notice when I have this layer tab, I have both color layers and height layers. That's part of what is really good about open space is it can do multi-resolution height terrain layers. Um, so in addition to being able to add a variety of color detail maps, I can also add both sort of the global base layer height map for the moon, um, but also individual patches of terrain data to give me super high resolution in individual spots. Uh, and so I have the wide angle camera, moon, um, digital elevation map, but I also have individual elevation maps for the Apollo landing sites. So let me uh, take a look at one of those Apollo landing sites. Um, so to John's question about how to look for other things, if you hit this focus button here, you can basically search for anything in open space um, to fly to it. Um, I have some extra secret commands built into that I'm going to show you in a, a few minutes um, to make my life with open space much easier. So I'm going to look at Apollo 17. Um, I'm going to run a macro that's going to set up all my layers correctly. If I can find where I put it. Uh, there we go. Um, yeah, that should do it. So I'm going to head over to the Apollo 17 landing site. So as I start to come in, um, so again, we should start to get the highest resolution available and start to max out that 100 meter per pixel data. And so these other data layers are going to start coming in. They're reading off my hard drive. Um, normally, they would be faster, but I'm obviously like streaming all of this and using up a bunch of my, <laughs> my memory for other purposes. Um, so as they come in, we're going to get uh, a couple additional layers. One is the Apollo 17 traverse map. Um, and then as I continue to drop down, we're going to get uh, that narrow angle camera imagery, um, as well as the height map. So right now, my LEM is floating in space because the height map hasn't populated correctly yet. Um, but this is what I'm talking about, about getting down to the human scale. So this is a really nice model of the Apollo 17 lander. Um, Carter uh, did this photogrammetrically from the lander at the National Air and Space Museum. Why aren't you popping down on the ground, friend? Um, try hitting one more button. There we go. All right. Um, so I've actually, yeah, set the time. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, set the time to the actual time of the Apollo 17 mission. Uh, you'll notice I'm getting some errors right now just because um, the kernel that drives the sun and Pluto don't have information at that time. But 
uh, fundamentally it's working. So uh, yeah, and you can actually see uh, because the narrow angle camera on the lunar reconnaissance order is about one meter per pixel, um, as I'm sure we have all seen over the last 10 years that LRO has been orbiting the moon, you actually have the ability to see the footprint of the lander as seen by LRO. Um, and even the the, um, the tracks from the rover and uh, astronaut footprints wandering around on the moon. So you really can move all the way from, you know, the scale we see the moon at as this giant disk in the sky down to human scale, down to the true size of the lunar lander in its true position on the moon and take people to the moon as an environment. And what I always think is like so cool about Apollo 17 that I never appreciated before is, um, you know, I think we're all very familiar with the Apollo 17 lunar panorama. Um, I've certainly used it as a background in planetary shows, even back in the slide days. Um, but yeah, really like when you get to see it, you can really see like what look like nearby hills in that panorama are actually mountains far, far away. Um, that's part of what's like so, so cool about being able to do this on a human scale. Um, there's some other cool features uh, built into open space so far if you load the right version. Um, so in addition to the lunar landers, there's also been some work being done on taking the pictures that the astronauts took on the moon and using them to generate photogrammetric models of some of the sites they actually visited on the moon. For example, um, here is a partial photogrammetric model of, I say this is the Station 6 Fragment 1 boulder. Um, so again, it's incomplete because of course they, they were not planning to do photogrammetry with the moon uh, and carefully index and take a picture of every side of the boulder from a perfect angle. Um, but it's a great way to see this example of what open space is capable of, what these like human scale um, explorations of the moon look like. Cause you're now like standing next to this boulder where Gene Cernan and Jack Schmidt actually stood. And uh, I, I can never remember exactly where it is, but somewhere, in this model um, is their actual footprint on the moon. Um, Micah says it's to the right, to the right, to the right. Uh, I'm probably not gonna find it without wasting a bunch of time. Oh, I had the right rock, Micah says. Sorry for my piloting everybody. Normally I'm better at this. Ah, here we go, yes. Um, so yeah, if you look down here, hopefully you can see it on the screen. Uh, yeah, that's actually like photogrammetric model from the Apollo imagery of a boot actually on the moon. Um, so what I'm talking about again, of like using open space, we can truly move from the celestial scale, the scale that, you know, we think of the universe at, to the human scale, make it something, really show people like, you know, this is a real place. People really walked here. This is a real footprint on the moon um, that we are recreating from real data to take you and explore the universe. And that is just like, that's so cool. I feel like that's that's what 21st planetariums are about is, you know, not just teaching people about the night sky, but teaching people that these worlds are real places. And in the case of the moon, a place we have actually been, a place we've actually seen, a place we have explored and a place that you can explore in the same detail and data as the people who actually went there using tools like open space. Um, a couple other basics I want to go through like that. Um, we've seen the moon. Um, open space also has a lot of really good Mars data in it. I just want to jump over to Mars. Here's Mars. Um, and once again, there's another place where the layers open space has available are going to come into key play because um, there's a lot of available map data for Mars. Uh, you know, it's it's often said that Mars is better mapped than the oceans of the Earth, and that's actually very true uh, because the oceans of Earth, you know, we have sort of limited bathymetry and SRTM data for, whereas of course Mars has been orbited by a whole suite of satellites for the last several years, um, giving us super excellent high resolution data. Uh, so Mars is going to tile in there and. Um, you know, I've sort of got the Viking base layer for Mars up right now, um, but open space has access to some really nice um, mosaics of Mars, especially the, what we call the CTX mosaic. Uh, so the CTX mosaic is the context camera on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. Um, the context camera has peak resolution of six meters per pixel. 
Um, so, you know, 18 feet ish per pixel. Uh, where are you at, context camera? Oh, that's why. Um, yeah, and so uh, 16 meters per pixel, which means you can really get down in this mosaic. Um, I think there might even be a newer mosaic that I'm not loading that there's a better one. Um, you can really get down and really get into super awesome detail on Mars. Uh, in addition to these higher resolution color layers, um, there's also higher resolution elevation layers. Um, so I can add those in addition. And uh, especially for individual sites, you can get really high resolution detail. Uh, so again, context hammer gets you down to six meters per pixel. Um, but if you really know where you're going on Mars, and I'm not going to say that I do. Um, I mean, I spend a lot of time on Mars, but it's a big planet. Uh, <laughs> it's a big planet. There's lots of cool places to be. Um, one time, what is it? Let me open up the time menu. Oh, yeah, it's paused. That's fine. Uh, Trying to get some, some of Valleys Marineris in here. Um, so yeah, if I jump down to Western Candor Chasma and turn on some additional height layers. Um, yeah, you can add basically uh, additional high rise and uh, here we go, um, CTX patches to open space. And so of course, having uh, high rise data really is what is gonna let you get into super amazing detail. Um, the high-rise camera on the MRO has a peak resolution of a third of a meter per pixel, so one foot per pixel. And so when you combine that with um, the high-rise digital terrain maps, which are stereographically generated from this data, once again, you can get down to the surface of Mars at human scale. Uh, and so of course, you know, no humans have set foot on Mars that we know of, um, but you can, <laughs> you can drop down to a truly human scale um, and make for your audiences a planet that they can actually set foot on, a planet they can experience, a planet they can see and feel as though they were explorers walking across the surface of Mars for the first time. And I'm not gonna say that I'm looking at the most interesting part of this imagery, but you know, you can see the little dune ripples here in Candor Chasma. Um, you know, there's all kinds of amazing terrain on Mars. You can get down into exploring detail. Um, and yeah, really make it for your audiences a living world with real geology, real geography. Um, and yeah, that's that's appreciable, I think. That that has a human scale to it, that where you can point to a boulder and say, get in here, like, uh, you know, you can point to these boulders and say, this boulder is the size of a car, or this boulder, boulder is the size of you. Um, that's the amazing bridge that or the amazing gap that open space bridges is taking these planets and bringing them down to the human scale and human appreciable geography yeah here's much better detail um yeah even like the individual rises of the dune ripples are within um the resolution of the data so you can really get down into these dune fields and yeah make it a planet um so these are the cool things that open space is able to do and be able to navigate these geography layers is the key to that. Now, a couple of things uh, to make open space nicer to share. Obviously, I am sharing it with all the windows and the GUIs up. Um, if you are doing a live stream program, you probably don't want it to look like that. And that's one of the other things I've helped a few people with. So I'm going to change my own screen share. And all right, so hopefully you're seeing my whole desktop again. Um, and that temporal resolution has dropped back down. Um, so there are different ways to sort of get rid of these windows on open space. Um, there are several shortcuts that you can use um, and you can find these in the documentation basically to get rid of the GUI and stuff. Um, and you also you know, get rid of these annotations up there too uh, to basically give you a nice clean empty interface where you're just looking at space. Um, and uh, then the other thing I've heard people is like, well, what about my mouse on the screen too? Um, open space is compatible with joysticks and Xbox controllers uh, or any you know USB controller, DirectX USB controller. So you can plug in a controller, uh, fly open space via controller. Um, and then, well, what if you want to still like access the GUI and menus and features? Um, and so that's where some of the other configurations come into handy. Um, so among the configurations, if I go back to the open space folder, um, 
and I dive into the config file, these contain different configurations that can be used to run open space. And so um, ones like uh, single GUI, uh, <laughs> the, the name is somewhat misleading. Uh, single GUI will actually generate two windows um, one of which is an empty control window that you can pilot around in and have the GUI. And the other one is the actual open space window looking out into space. And so by setting up like that, you can basically have a blank window. You can put on one monitor, have all your controls in, have your mouse in, and then another window that is just showing space in open space. Um, and thus allow you to have a clean, professional, smooth looking stream. Um, open space also has the ability to stream to spout. Um, so if you know how to use Spout, which is a Windows protocol for capturing um, stream data in a browser, if you know how to use Spout, OpenSpace can also output uh, its visual side to Spout and be captured directly by a browser, um, which can then be streamed to YouTube or other streaming sources. Um, I don't do a lot with Spout, but it is available there if you want to be able to use it. Um, another thing that we do at the Academy to really clean up our interface too is um, because OpenSpace has a WebSocket, you can control it with a web browser control. Um, and I really owe a ton of this to uh, Micah and the Open Space team. Um, I, I have thrown out Micah's name a couple of times. He's in the chat, but uh, Micah Anakapura is the, um, hopefully I, I said your last name right from memory. Uh, Micah is um, the Open Space integration lead at AMH. Uh, and so he does a ton of the work on making the software work, and he has provided amazing guidance uh, as we have figured out how to do things at the Academy. Um, and so basically once he showed us how to access this WebSocket that like really set us off and running with what we want to do at the Academy. And so I'm going to drag in another window and the way I've been controlling open space this whole time I've been showing you other than, you know, clicking around in the GUI is I have a web page that I have built out controls in. Um, these are very simple, uh, because I don't like doing a lot of work if I can help it. <laughs> um, I can like see Howard waving around on my screen. I know that Siler has built some much more elaborate controls for access and open space. Um, but this is a great thing to consider setting up um, if you want to have really good control over open space. If you don't want to be digging around in those menus all the time, it's great to make yourself some shortcuts. Um, you can program shortcuts to be associated with a keystroke in open space, but I don't like doing that because I don't like having to memorize keystrokes. My brain is already like completely full of blender keystrokes. Um, I assume Howard's like actually talking to somebody and not just like waving on the screen to distract me. <laughs> um, uh, um, yeah, uh, so yeah, I don't like using keystroke shortcuts. I like having buttons that do something. And the whole way in order to set this up, um, you need to have a web server that is talking to open space. Uh, and so the way I do that um, is I am running a web server on my computer. Uh, obviously, this is not actually going out to the internet. It is exclusively hosting a website on my computer for access on my computer only. Um, you can do this with any Apache server that you feel comfortable setting up. Um, personally, I use WAMP um, just out of habit and having been using it for several years to um, do projects like this. Um, but inside of my web server install, I'm hosting web pages that can talk to open space. It's like this one I'm using right now um, uh, goes back to last December when we hosted the American Geophysical Union Conference here at the Academy. Um, and it is, it is um, yeah, a JavaScript web page that is um, sending strings to open space of the very commands that open space uses. And these are actually really easy to build once you know what to do. Um, because all of these commands are actually the commands from open space. And what is really, really helpful with open space is going back to my open space install um, and going back to these log folders. Actually, let me go to the install I've been running. In these log folders, there's a file called scriptlog.txt. And this scriptlog.txt is a list of every single thing open space has done since you've had it open. So if you ever want to know what is the command to do this in open space, basically do it in open space. Um, <laughs> turn a layer on or off. Go to a planet, focus on a planet, turn a planet on and off, turn an orbit on and off, change the color of an orbit. Anytime you do any of those things, it will print out in the script log what you were doing. Um, I saw Sarah just asked, are these websites shareable? Yes, I would be happy to share with anyone who wants um, the controls I've already written for open space. Um, if, if you're comfortable setting up your own web server, I'm happy to send you the controls I've written. Uh, just shoot me an email afterwards. Um, the one Caveat, I would say, with this script log, uh, and this might be my own fault for using an older version of the open space JavaScript and not updating it, is um, open space prints these commands with a double quote. Um, 
at least with the version of JavaScript, I have double quotes break, <laughs> break the JavaScript. Uh, so I have to convert all those double quotes to a single quote. Um, but basically, once you have that, you can program in macros and shortcuts and even um, logic-based toggles um, that will make it a little bit easier for you to fly and pilot open space without digging around in the GUI windows. And uh, like I was being like, oh, I don't know why that's not working or, or where's that? Um, but giving a smooth, professional, clean presentation to your audience where everything you wanna do is already programmed into a macro. You can, you can have the visual reminder of a button and let that guide you through presenting your program. And so I have so many like helpful buttons written up for, for various different shows. Um, we of course also use these for our uh, presentations with our, our daily shows um, to give the presenters a familiar, easy, smooth presentation. Um, and yeah, this lets our presenters see this. Uh, I just saw um, John ask again, uh, do we create these as um, JavaScript scripts? Um, really it's just, uh, you know, the JavaScript is just to provide the logic function. Um, and then you know it's an HTML5 wrapper for the whole web page, and the individual button controls are in the open space scripting language itself. Um, so it's a little bit of a combination of all three, but you don't need to know a lot of JavaScript to make anything happen. Um, especially if you just take, if you just email me, I send you some web pages, and you just start messing them up. Um, <laughs> but you know, playing around with them, changing things. Um, it's all fairly straightforward. Like, uh, you know, doing some of these logic toggles, they're just, they're, they're requesting open space, return a current value, evaluating that value, and then, you know, an if else statement for what to do with that value. Um, so it's really, really helpful um, for making a smooth presentation. And as Ryan just mentioned, uh, our presentation staff is doing a weekly live stream presentation in open space. Um, and so you can get to see basically how they are working with this setup, uh, which hopefully makes for a smooth, seamless presentation um, as they tour us through the universe or uh, the solar system. Uh, as, as I mentioned too, of course, open space, you know, Mars, uh, Mercury and Moon are the default layer sets that are available. Um, at the Academy, because we use open space to do a tour of the solar system, we want to be able to explore more than just those planets. Um, so uh, we are very lucky at the Academy that we get to work very closely with NASA Ames, um, just down the peninsula. NASA Ames, of course, does a lot of that ingesting and processing of map data from other planets. Um, but all this data is actually available publicly anyway. Like we're really lucky they, they send it to us uh, nice and clean and processed, but um, all of this data can be downloaded from uh, basically the USGS or NASA Ames website. Um, and uh, if you know what to do with GDAL, you can basically process these so open space can ingest additional high resolution map data. Um, or you can email me and I can send you like a hundred gigabyte download. Um, uh, but yeah, this this will really like, I think really flesh out what your open space install might be capable of. Um, because we'll add, I mean, we have so much data on so many bodies in our solar system. Like of course, um, let me see if I can move this to a more useful time. Um, I've got like three different control windows open for different shows, as you can see. Uh, da, 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 da. Um, but you know, we just we know so much about our. Oh, that's the wrong direction. Uh, about our solar system, we have so many places we can go in super high detail. So many incredible stories that we can tell. Um, I just want to drop down onto Pluto, of course, because we have the amazing. Uh, both New Horizons imagery map, but also the height resolution texture map, um, which uh, if you were at Pleiades conference, you got to hear Paul Shank do a presentation on himself, um, you know, talk about like the amazing geology there. You basically, you can have the whole solar system at your fingertips with open space and turn so many of these planets again into, as I would like to say, uh, real worlds that people can visit um, and really take your audiences on a really, cool tour. Um, I just saw a question about also open space outputting dome masters. Uh, so again, that gets into your configuration of open space. Um, so again, with the launcher, uh, I'm running it in a single windowed view. Um, come on, come on. Open up. All right. Um, but in addition to the single windowed view, there are uh, basically fisheye rendering. So you can do a 1K fisheye, um, you know, 4K fisheye, basically four rendering output. Um, and I even have, I don't think it's a list here. I have a portable dome configuration that I, I've made based off 
um, basically that single fish eye or, or single fish eye or uh, single fish eye goop is probably the same as what my portable dome output was now. Um, but yeah, for uh, working with our portable dome, yeah, we set one up so that we have again that two window output of open space um, where we have a blank GUI control on the um, control computer, and then the projector is displaying only a fisheye view of open space for the portable dome. Um, one caveat I will give you with using open space if you want to try to render fisheye output from it is the core of the data in open space is still the American Museum of Natural History's digital universe package. Um, so of course, Digital Universe has, for most of the last 20 years, been the backbone of so much planetarium software. Um, but of course, it is a licensed, uh, uh, basically a closed license project product from the American Museum of Natural History. And at least as of um, the Open Space Consortium last year, uh, it is still the preference of AMH that, or it's still, frankly, the license terms of AMH that you may not use this for rendered production projects. Um, so um, sadly, we have open source software that has closed source data in it. Um, you know, uh, planetary map terrain, you're probably cool with because that is public NASA information, but things like star catalog, um, basically the digital universe assets are still under the digital universe license. So just be wary of that. Um, but for real time streaming presentations, you should be all clear to do whatever you want with open space and stream and share it to your audiences. Um, and if you want more information on creating rendered projects, uh, you should definitely contact the AM and H people, including um, Corey, who is in the chat right now, and she can definitely give you more information or possibly more up to date information um, on how you might be able to use open space if you want to use it for rendered projects. Um, yeah, so that, that's just sort of one of the only things to be concerned about. Um, open space also currently, you can record a flight path. Um, and so basically that will uh, record every single thing you do in open space. So you can create a flight that you can play back. Um, it currently does not provide direct rendering to video, I believe, unless that has changed. Um, you can take screenshots, uh, you can add slides, but um, you can't render directly to video frames. Uh, I believe all the videos been made with open space so far are done via video capture. Um, so running through open space through a, a capture input setup. Um, rather than direct rendering out of the software. But obviously that is something that is going to be changing as the software continues to evolve in the future to allow direct rendering out of open space um, and make it both a presentation tool and a more useful production tool. But um, currently its strength and focus is definitely on live presentation um, and especially this free form exploration and flight. Um, and it's something I would encourage, of course, everyone to try, everyone to play with, um, you know, we, uh, any one of us can be a master live presenter. Um, and open space is just one more tool in that arsenal. And especially because it's open source, it's not just a great tool for you to use, but it's a great one to use and share with your audiences. Just like Worldwide Telescope was saying, you can download this program at home and you can do this exact same exploration at home. Um, you know, I'm showing you my favorite parts of the universe, my favorite parts of the solar system. But because this is open source software, uh, downloading a lot of public data, it's a great interface for you yourself to go on an exploration tour of the solar system uh, and discover and explore the solar system with the same ease and comprehensiveness of, um, of like using Google Earth or something like that, um, but with a more comprehensive view of the entire universe. Uh, so the project is uh, continuing to grow, continue to expand, more data is being added all the time. Um, you know, we are continuing to learn how to ingest and add data ourselves. Um, as mentioned, open space, you know, sort of by default relies on the synchronization scheme so that everybody gets the same data downloaded to them from the open space servers. Um, but it is possible to add your own data to open space. Um, it takes a little bit to learn about. Uh, a couple of things I, I should show you actually is um, all your data. Well, the actual like downloaded data all lives in this sync folder. Um, that's open space syncing to the server, but a lot of other stuff lives in this data folder. Um, the assets folder within the data folder is what contains your scenes in open space, uh, which is what tells open space what to load. Um, uh, and so basically these asset re require commands are telling open space where to look for files in the directories to add them to your scene. Uh, and you can edit these, you can dig through, you can see what's in open space, um, add or remove things, uh, see how you can change the scene, see, see what you can add. Um, and then uh, you can also write your own new data into, into open space, um, which is something we have absolutely done. Um, you know, like, uh, you know, we're, we're partial to a more heat map visualization of the cosmic microwave background here at the Academy. 
Um, so that is like an additional asset we have written into open space. Um, and rather than using the synchronized asset, it is using a locally stored resource in its own data folder um, to read that data locally uh, so that I can store my own data in open space um, that doesn't conflict with the synchronized data coming down from the open space website. Um, so that is something you have to, you can manipulate yourself. Um, it's definitely a very, yeah, again, intensive program. It's still in development, so it is certainly not optimized for smooth running. It's really optimized for pulling in as much data and visualizing it as quickly and as well as possible. Um, so that's gonna be very heavy on your system. Uh, and then the other thing worth pointing out is in this data assets customization folder, this globe browsing to asset file, um, this is what stores, or basically what tells OpenSpace where to find that high resolution map data. Um, so here are those, those uh, default additional ones I downloaded from the website, um, Mars, Moon, and Mercury. Uh, and then below that, I have added additional map reference data for several other bodies in the solar system um, so that it can access those additional data layers that I have processed and added to open space. And again, if you want um, more detailed information on any of that, just shoot me an email. I can talk to you about what I've done to modify open space. Um, so that's a super... I mean, I've already used up an hour right now, which I was worried about. Um, but that's a super brief tour, hopefully, of setting up open space, finding your way through the basic things, and getting a feel for the kind of things that open space can do, um, as well as hopefully like a little taste of some of the ways you can start to expand and grow open space beyond what is the default um, components of it uh, to make your user interface experience more smooth, as well as make the presentation to your audience more smooth. Um, and so as we have said, uh, if you, um, at 4.30 Pacific time, uh, what would that be? 7.30 Eastern time, um, yeah, rest of the time zones from there. Uh, if you tune in on the Morrison Planetarium Facebook page, you will get to see one of our presenters take you on a tour of the solar system using open space. Um, and so you can see how we have uh, set up the streaming capability for Morrison Planetarium itself. Um, and hopefully, you know, we will keep, hopefully when we reopen, we'll continue to do many, many more open space presentations, uh, get to continue to be involved in the open space community. And as you know, I mean, I'm always very big on like information should be free. Um, there's nothing special we know that no one else shouldn't know. Uh, and so if I can ever help answer any questions, get you started with open space, get you cool data that we've added to it, um, just let me know because it's such an important, such a useful tool. Um, it, it's something that everyone, regardless of what your primary software provider is, could add to your system and give you some amazing capabilities to tell new stories uh, explore the solar system and explore the universe in new ways and find new ways to connect to your audience. And, and like I said, I, I feel like achieve the whole mission of a 21st century planetarium of making the universe feel real and give our audiences an emotional connection to the universe. Um, so I think open space is a great way to do that. A great tool worth exploring. Um, it's again, it's, it's a beta. It's still super nascent. Um, things are changing all the time. Uh, new features are being added all the time. Um, there's a lot to learn. There's a lot that's changing, but even with where it is now, there's a lot to learn. So um, thanks for tuning in and uh, I'll turn it back over to Michael. Thank you, Dan. I think that was uh, one of our more well-received uh, presentations here at the e-conferences. And so uh, I know that, of course, Dan went over a lot of stuff today, um, all of it incredibly useful. And we're going to try to work with Dan in the future, given, um, you know, uh, young child parenting schedules to try to put together perhaps a, a bit more of an advanced open space uh, tutorial. Um, and we'll try to have that um, set up with enough time where, you know, you, everybody can plan for it. Um, and we'll work with Dan to make sure that it's a time, of course, that works for him to go over a few more of these uh, you know, beyond the basics of open space. But uh, once again, Dan, thanks so much for everything. Uh, of course, if you're looking for more information, um, we're going to have the the chat posted with all of the um, all of the websites, and then we'll try to put as much of that as we can onto DoneDialogues.org, the mirror site, as well as the event page uh, for eConference 11 on the Facebook group. Uh, so now we transition over into our um, our recurring segments of the week. And to kick off uh, our segments this week, long German words of the week with Anna Green. All right, so um, this week uh, I'm back to saying them. Um, so I don't, I don't have a native speaker with me right now. Um, 
So yeah, uh, let's just roll into the first word. Um, so the first word, um, Michael, if you can put it up, thank you, is uh, das Spiegelfernrohr. Das Spiegelfernrohr. So is that a reflecting telescope or is it a polar alignment? All right, so we're looking through. We've got about two thirds of the votes in. Wow. Looks like it's pretty overwhelmingly in favor of uh, of one versus the other. We'll wait until we get to about eighty percent before we uh, we go in ahead and close that. All right, so about a minute in, uh, about eighty percent of our our. Uh, our uh, attendees say reflecting telescope. Uh, the others say polar alignment. Anna, what is the correct answer? Spiegel means mirror, and Fernrohr is one of the many ways that you can say telescope. So yes, in this case, that is a reflecting telescope. Good work, guys. Very good. Very good. All right. So word two. Die Schwindigkeitsbegrenzung. Die Geschwindigkeit, sorry, die Geschwindigkeitsbegrenzung. Die Geschwindigkeitsbegrenzung. Sorry, I say another word regularly that has some of this word in it. So, uh, anywho, is that the measurement of wind gusts or is that the speed limit? All right, looks we're a little bit more than half for measurement of wind gusts uh, over speed limits. So Anna, what is our correct answer? Uh, so Geschwindigkeit is speed and Begrenzung would be limit. So it has the word um, Grenze in it, which is um, like the border or limit. Um, and uh, Geschwindigkeit, uh, you can pair that up nicely with Licht, which is light, and it becomes Lichtgeschwindigkeit or light speed. Right, excellent. And then finally, question number three, we're gonna launch the poll now. All right, so question number three, die Nahrungsmittelunverträglichkeit, die Nahrungsmittelunverträglichkeit, is that food intolerance or the scaled away produce at like the market or a grocery store? I feel like I need thinking music going here. Each week we're going to start adding, we'll add background music and then a soundboard and just go crazy with it. All right. I think so. we'd all be happy if Anna would, Anna would sing. Oh, I don't know if my neighbors would be. The walls are pretty thin and I'm pretty loud, as you all know. <laughs> and also pretty darn good. Well, thank you. All right, so what about a minute in? Well, I think we've got all of our votes in. Almost exactly 50-50 between food intolerance and a scale to weigh produce. Anna, what is our correct answer? Nahrungsmittel is food and Verträglichkeit is um, tolerance or you know getting along and you put that um on it and it becomes intolerance. So that is a food intolerance. And you get a bonus word this week that you don't have to guess on. Uh, at the beginning, there was a very odd turn to the conversation. And I was asked how you say cannibalism in German. And I'm going to disappoint you on this one. It's cannibalismus. So it's, it's pretty much a cognate. So. Well, but at least we know. So the bonus word of the week there works out pretty well. Well, thank you, Anna, for uh, another 
fantastic trio of long German words of the week. Um, I can see for the first time, Patty Seaton has missed one of the words. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Uh, and Ryan, of course, we will copy and paste the words in there as we do. Um, I'll just take care of that in a little bit. All right. So um, we are going to um, switch uh, and flip the, the timing for uh, the artist corner and the record shop. So the record shop is going to come at 1.30. Next up, the artist corner with Jackie Ballman. And just to give you guys an idea, the way that these are going to work is Jackie's working under the assumption that you actually know uh, Photoshop and Illustrator. It's more to show like the, the whiz bang cool stuff. Um, and then of course, if you don't, that's what our tutorials will be for so that you'll have a, a better understanding of why these are so impressive in and of themselves. That way we get to see the really, really cool stuff. Uh, and uh, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna stop talking and just turn it over to Jackie. So Jackie, take it away. Hello everyone. Thank you for wanting me to keep talking at you, I guess. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to open Illustrator, but it's not showing up. So I'm just going to share the whole damn screen. Okay, so uh, you know we have we have Illustrator, and I have you know spacey backgrounds like everyone does. Um, so there is so many things, so many things I can show you guys. And like you know, I've been doing, been working in these programs for a very, very, very long time. So trying my best to uh you know make it so you guys don't feel overwhelmed um so you know we have illustrator and there is like so many things you could start doing but if you wanted to begin a few things the one one thing i would ask you guys to start playing around with is the pen tool and so it is over here um and it is the easiest tool that you can use and so you can start between you know yeah, it looks like a like a pin. Um, so you can add a point anywhere. And Illustrator is wonderful because it gives you uh, like lines and shows you where the middle is and how it's lining up. And so it, it really helps. So you can make straight lines. Uh, Control Z works a lot. Um, you can take away the points. You can whatever. Okay, so I'm going to do a curve. And so you can do that by clicking and dragging. And then it'll bring up anchor points, which are wonderful. And if you wanted to, you know, make a circle, you could just hover over the starting points and where you see the circle, and then you can click and drag to make the anchor points again. If you wanted to uh, do something more with that, you can do a couple more key commands, uh, or you can go over here to these two arrows. So. The one thing that's got me confused right at the very beginning when I first got into a vector program was that there was two arrows. Why is there two arrows? So one of them is a selection tool and the other one is a direct selection tool. And so uh, the, just the plain selection tool just picks up the pieces. Uh, the direct selection tool directly selects one object, one point. So you can click and drag and do whatever you wanted with it. Um, so you can move the handles. And that, let's just say that, you know, so there's a bunch of things we can do. Okay, so I'm not gonna go too much into it. So I'm making sure that I'm keeping an eye on the time because I do wanna show you a few things in Photoshop too. So try playing with the pen tool. And then if you wanted to, let me get some of this stuff out of the way. Um, so if you wanted to change the thickness of your lines, you can go over here to the stroke and then you can click whatever points that are available here or you can just type in whatever um so 50. um so that didn't work because i did something wrong <laughs> um i changed it somehow switched that and i have no idea why i did that so um make sure you do uh change the colors okay let me, I, I know I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, there's like the the downside to doing one of these uh, for just 10 minutes is that there's so many things to tell you guys. Um, so please ask me any questions if you are getting lost, but uh, you can change the colors here. You can change the line quality to that. And, you know, so there's a bunch of things you can do with just the pen tool. And so as you saw with my just with my um, little intro 
presentation last week, uh, I brought in an image and clicked on it and made the dippers. So you could do something like that if you wanted to bring in an image and make your own star charts. And so um, like there's, there's so many things you can do with just the pen tool. And so the pen tool is really most useful. You don't need a, a uh, drawing tablet like I normally use to use vector programs because uh, mainly there's a lot of clicking and there's a lot of using points. So it would be a lot easier to just use the mouse, which is I normally do with vector programs. So we're going to close that for now and I don't need to save it because what am I doing? Um, and now we're gonna open up Photoshop. Give me a second while I open up Photoshop. I didn't wanna kill my computer battery by just having both Photoshop and Illustrator open. So uh, Photoshop, you know, you work with photos. Um, normally I draw in Photoshop because it's a lot easier to draw on in Photoshop than it is in Illustrator. And actually it's more annoying for me to draw in Photoshop or in Illustrator. So I usually just uh, draw anything. I do all my drawings in Photoshop, uh, but you can manipulate photos. And so one of the things that I would recommend messing with in Photoshop is the lasso tool. Okay, so it's a lasso. Um, and so you can drag it. So we have the little dipper here and I'm going to just drag around the dipper and I'm going to try to uh, move it. And it's not going to let me because over here in the layers, it is a um, it's a smart object. And so that just means that it's not going to let me manipulate it at all. So you would need to rasterize the image. OK, so to do that, you would right click and rasterize layer. And now you can manipulate it. So um, if I'm going to hover over my selection, I'm going to hold down the command key or the control key and click and drag. And so you can move it and you can make it bigger and do some other cool things with it. Um, of course, uh, the exit key is, is great. The spec, the escape key is great because, you know, if you messed up, your cat walks across your keyboard, it's the best thing. Um, also control Z is really wonderful too. So, um, I'm going to control Z that a couple times. Now you can also make it a brand new layer. So if we uh, control X or control or command X, so cutting the selection and then control V, so paste, it will paste it into a new layer. And so that's really wonderful. So if you just have like a few pieces that you want to do. Um, so how can you use Photoshop in your planetarium? Well, um, maybe you can make some cutout pictures, I guess, or um, you can uh, manipulate, you know, if you want, you know, a circle based on your, uh, on the circumpolars. It's like there's, like Photoshop is a little bit more of an advanced program that I really want to suggest a uh, novice to start with. Um, there is specific things you can do in Photoshop that would be really useful, but if you are uh, brand new to digital programs, I would suggest to not just randomly do Photoshop if you, unless you have a specific plan. Um, there is tons and tons and tons of tutorials online that I use, and I suggest everyone to, you know, just look for things on, um, Look for things on uh, on the internet. Just Google whatever you need to look up. Uh, I do all the time. Uh, specific, you know, very very specific. Like, how do I make wood grain in Illustrator? Because I've had to do that too many times. Um, I've also uh, I own for some reason Classroom in the book for uh, Adobe products because I like books too much and. Um, they do go step by step for every every tool, and it's just like you are learning learning in the in a book. So if you are serious about wanting to do more than just intro things, I would suggest to find Classroom a book for whatever version of Adobe products you have. Or 
uh, I've noticed there isn't very much change between each version. So it doesn't take much to just, uh, if you happen to find like a three cent one at a secondhand bookstore of CS3 and you have CS5, for example, um, I would suggest, you know, maybe, maybe get just picking up and just seeing what you can do with it. And it goes through lessons. It sometimes has a CD, uh, which is not too useful for me because I don't have a disk drive on my computer. <laughs> so um, if there is two things, a very, 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 very much of a crash course of these two programs. If you do have any questions, please feel free to ask me and spam me with on in Facebook or whatever, email me, I don't care. Uh, I will do my best to help you out. Uh, I think that's it. And there's my time. Hey, so mute me, Michael. <laughs> oh, no, you, you can mute yourself. Well, thanks, Jackie. Um, so that's the artist corner. And now, of course, we get to go right uh, to the record shop uh, with Mike Smale. Hey, thanks, Michael. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the record shop. Uh, thanks for switching me around at a work meeting run long. Uh, for those of you uh, that have been here before, you know the drill, but for those of you like Howard George who are new, uh, we're going to go through three records, uh, talk a little bit about them, and at the end of each one, we'll put some info in the chat uh, so you can look them up, uh, download them, listen to them yourself, uh, do whatever you might, uh, might like to do. So let's get started. Uh, our first record for today is a record by uh, a composer. It's called A Song for Echo. The composer's name is Ricardo Donoso, and he's a, he's a Brazilian composer who lives in Boston now. And this was a record I was, uh, last summer, I was at Used Kids Records, which is a shop in Columbus, Ohio, where I'm from. And I was just kind of thumbing through the stacks, and I had heard of Ricardo Donoso before. Uh, so I, I pull out the record, and I wasn't familiar with it, but I, I flip it over, and I look at the back, and I read... Original soundtrack, A Song for Echo, a collaboration between filmmaker Julie Nyman and composer Ricardo Donoso, premiered at the Charles Hayden Planetarium at the Museum of Science, Boston, Massachusetts, September 2013. I said, hmm, well, I have to buy this now. Uh, and uh, so uh, what it is, is uh, Julie Nyman created a, uh, about, it was about a, a 20, 29, 30 minute long uh, live action full dome film. And it is about uh, the myth of Echo and Narcissus, which I know there's not really constellations associated with either of them, so it may not be as familiar to, uh, to all of you. Uh, but she created this, uh, this live action uh, full dome film uh, about that myth. And then uh, the music that was composed went along with it. And it's, uh, it's, fairly, it's fairly soft, fairly minimal. Uh, the, the opening, uh, the opening side is called Dawn, the uh, side B is called Dusk, and the music does sort of respond, uh, respond appropriately. It uh, starts with a little more, a little more festive springy, some bells, some drums, some, some upbeat. Uh, and then by the time you get to the, uh, the flip side, it starts to really kind of, kind of darken and get uh, a little, a little more moody, uh, a little more uh, cacophonous. And uh, this, um, the, uh, the vinyl version of it, uh, there were 300 copies put out basically on the, the artist's, uh, artist's own label, uh, 150 copies on black, 150 copies on white uh, to sort of map the, uh, the dawn and the dusk uh, theming. And let's share some information here. Uh, so the, you can't easily get the, uh, get the record anymore, but you can listen to it and uh, you can buy it on his uh, band camp for a couple, a couple bucks. The, the second link there is actually a link to the artist's page, which has some more information about the Full Dome film, uh, including about a five minute uh, short of it that you can watch. So if you're curious a little bit about how that was, how that was constructed, how that plays out, uh, that, that might be of interest to you. Yes, the album, yes, the album is on Pitchfork. It got, well, like a 7.2 or a 7.5, something like that. So um, can't all be bad, but of course, I mean, we can talk about how Pitchfork grades records. I mean, that's, that's like a four hour long conversation right there. Uh, <laughs> anyways, uh, our, next, uh, our next record uh, for today is by William Basinski. It's called On Time, Out of Time. And this was released last year on Temporary Residence. Uh, William Basinski is also kind of an ambient, um, instrumental kind of chill electronic composer. But what makes this particular piece uh, unique is that for On Time Out of Time, the source material that he worked from 
were the initial recordings of the black hole collision recorded by LIGO, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. Uh, he got the basically uh, a, a couple of exclusive source recordings from LIGO and then uh, built off of them, stretched them out. And uh, the record itself is uh, basically two kind of two 20 minute tracks. Uh, one is the, uh, the primary and then the second is kind of a, kind of a remixed version of it. Uh, on time, out of time. So again, very, uh, very laid back, very easy going. Uh, it would be good stuff to listen to if you're, uh, you know, flying around the universe in open space or whatever your uh, software package of choice might happen to be. Uh, of course, provided you get all the, the rights worked out and everything there. Uh, the first link is direct to his Bandcamp, and then the uh, the second link is to his website, where you can explore a lot of his other work. Uh, he's done some really interesting kind of musical experimentation. Um, one of uh, one of his big things was a, a huge box set called the Disintegration Loops, where he actually used like decades old tape recording of his earlier creations that had sort of decayed and rotted, and then used that to kind of make new music out of uh, out of that, which was uh, pretty interesting. Something uh, it's uh, Again, it's it's not for everyone, but it can be uh, it can be unique and can be kind of fun to, to listen to. So that's uh, William Basinski, and then uh, last but not least, <clears throat> send you home with uh, something new I've been listening to, something new I just picked up, um, and kind of ties into last week's baseball theme a little bit, and that is the newest seven inch from the Pine Hill Haints. It is called Satchel Page Blues, and it is a, a two track. The opening track uh, all about legendary uh, baseball pitcher Satchel Page. The, uh, the B-side is a, uh, a cover of the traditional song, Whiskey in the Jar. Uh, the Pine Hill Haints, for those of you who may not have heard of them, are hands down one of my like, all-time favorite musical groups. They play a self-described genre of music known as Alabama ghost country music. And I know what you're probably asking yourself. You're saying, Mike, what is Alabama ghost country music? And Alabama ghost country music could best be described as music that is sort of dead to the modern world. Uh, uses a lot of older style instrumentation, fiddles and banjos, uh, you know, wash tub bass, washboards, saws, things like that. Uh, you could sort of lump it in with kind of a bluegrass or a folk, um, but uh, listening to their recordings, you'll hear a, a good mix of uh, new songs and a good mix of traditional songs. Like I said, the, with the whiskey in the jar cover on the backside of, uh, of this seven inch is a pretty great one. Uh, they're based out of Florence, Alabama, in the uh, teeming metroplex of Florence Muscle Shoals in northern uh, Northern Alabama, and they uh, they release a lot of their stuff on Arkham Records, which is their own. Um, Jamie Barrier, who's run as head of the band, is uh, his own his own label. Uh, they have an, an extensive discography, and again, uh, Satchel Page Blues. Uh, you get two variants. You got a, a nice uh, a nice orange uh, Giants colored variant, if you will, and then a nice blue uh, maybe Dodger colored variant. Uh, for those of you who are baseball fans. All right, well, that's what I had uh, with me for this week. Uh, let me switch over and give you all the last, uh, the last quick, the, uh, the quick hit. Again, these, uh, these images, uh, this additional information uh, is also available in the, uh, in the Google group. Uh, we archive them every week. Uh, but again, Ricardo Donoso, A Song for Echo, uh, William Basinski, On Time, Out of Time, two really nice uh, ambient sort of chill releases. And then uh, some a little more upbeat, fun uh, foot stomping music, uh, the Satchel Page Blues from the Pine Hill Haints. All right, well, that's what I had for you this week. Uh, thanks so much for your time. And uh, like I said, questions uh, in the chat, uh, additional pitchfork reviews you happen to find, uh, whatever, <laughs> feel free to share away. And uh, thanks, and we'll see you all next time. Thank you, Mike, as always, for taking us to the record shop. And then our last recurring segment of the week, uh, let's go back to San Francisco for the Pandemic Prima podcast party for you, Planetarian. Ladies and gentlemen, Mary Holt. Thanks, Michael. Let me share my screen. Da, 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 da. There we go. All right. Uh, okay. Everyone can see me and hear me okay and see that? Awesome. So welcome everybody once again to PPP PFP as I like to call it because I'm not as good as actually saying the title uh, as Michael is there. Uh, but this is my recurring segment where I just recommend podcasts for all of you to listen to because if you're like me, sometimes you need something non work or astronomy related to to think about or explore. So that's what we're going to do right now. And I was trying to decide which theme to go with this time and the idea came to me of looking for 
uh, podcasts that specifically do really good interviews. And at first I was like, oh, I'm not going to have many. But then I discovered there's actually a lot. So today's uh, uh, it, episode is brought to you by Badass Interviews. And as always, Squarespace. So let's go. All right. So the first one is one that I'm surprised I haven't recommended yet because this is Seriously, I know I say this a lot, but one of my all-time favorite podcasts of like period. Um, and this is one that is a go-to, like if there's a new episode I watch, I listen to it like immediately. Like it's always really good. And uh, Anna Sale is just a really good interviewer. Um, she sounds totally genuine every time she's talking to people and has this beautiful soothing voice and everything and uh, talks about really interesting things with interesting people. And the tagline for the show is, uh, the things we think about a lot, I need to talk about more. So that's kind of the overall uh, theme of the show, but they talk about all sorts of different things. It gets into a lot of uh, interesting stuff. And another good interview podcast that hasn't uh, had any new episodes in a really long time, which makes me very sad, uh, but is from Phoebe Robinson, uh, So Many White Guys, uh, which the theme behind this show is the fact that uh, she was frustrated with the amount of of white men in podcasting and decided to do a show where she interviews exclusively not white men. And the last episode of every season has the token white guy that she interviews. So <laughs> there's really awesome conversations on that one as well. And uh, another one that kind of half of the show is interviews is It's Been a Minute. So every week, Sam Sanders, who was formerly of, um, I believe he used to be on the NPR politics podcast. Uh, every week he has a weekly wrap, which is just a, uh, a new show. But the other one that he releases is uh, a, an interview show. So he has a news episode and a interview episode every week. So he interviews a different, different person every week. Very good. And one that I just discovered a few days ago and then um, binge listened to the first five episodes that were available um, is this one called Come Through uh, with Rebe Rebecca Carroll, where she's talking to folks about race and culture, uh, specifically in the time that we are living right now, which personally is a banana's time, if you ask me. Uh, so she's just interviewing people about things around all the things it says here, diversity, inclusion, climate change, uh, racism, and all sorts of interesting, uh, important topics. And then kind of getting away from the strictly like traditional interview style or whatever, I would say heavyweight kind of falls into this realm of interviews. Uh, so the idea behind this podcast is he would find a person that has some sort of unresolved like conflict or thing that they have with some other person and he kind of just like connects people together and like tries to solve mysteries for people sort of but it is also kind of an interview podcast because he's talking to individual people each time for the whole thing it's very very cool very interesting um i was actually talking to someone at work about how moby is a garbage person but there's one of the first uh, episodes of this podcast features Mo moby prominently because the person he talks to uh, was the man who gave Moby some of the records that turned that he used for some of his uh, first very popular CDs. So that's a really interesting episode if you want to start with that one. And then lastly, uh, kind of continuing farther away from the strict interview theme, but another uh, podcast I'm also surprised I haven't recommended yet is Song Exploder, where each one, uh, Rishi K. Shiraway talks to an artist about a particular song that they did and they break apart the song and talk about how they made it like each step of the way and they play different clips of the song like before it's fully made. And then at the end of the episode, they play the song. And this is a wonderful podcast to listen to if you're running, I use it for running a lot. And then the last few I have here, I'm gonna go through really quick because these are ones that I know of, but I personally haven't listened to. Most of these were recommended to me uh, by my brother. He's an also, also an avid podcast listener, but a classic of course is Fresh Air with Terry Gross on NPR. Uh, another one that I have heard occasionally, but don't listen to super often, but is very funny. Conan O'Brien Needs a Friend where he just talks to people and is funny. Um, and WTF with Mark Marin. I'm not too familiar with this one, but my brother says it's good. So there you go. 
And then I have one more to leave you with that fit really well with last week's theme of podcasts that go along with TV shows and movies, but I didn't find out about this until the later that day. So I wasn't able to share it with you guys, but uh, the guys from Reply All just started this new podcast where they're going through and watching scary movies because one of the hosts, PJ Vote, hates scary movies and cannot watch them and gets incredibly scared. And the other uh, host, Alex, loves them. So they're trying to sort of uh, exposure therapy with PJ to see if he can (laughs) start to like scary movies. So if you like scary movies or if you're like PJ and you hate them and you want to try to like them, you can uh, listen along with them. But yeah. And that's what I got for you today. Hopefully you can check out some of those and enjoy them. And thank you all for listening to me again. Well, thank you, Mary. And uh, I'll plug uh, Fresh Air as well. They are, uh, it's a product of WHYY here in Philadelphia. So it's one of the better NPR stations in the country and we want to keep it strong. So do listen to Fresh Air. Um, they're based out of Center City. And so go, go Eastern Pennsylvania. Uh, so that is a great segue uh, out of our podcast into Open Forum. Uh, if there's anything that anyone would like to discuss, um, Ben, is there anything you'd like to discuss? <laughs> Where are the African animals? That's exactly the answer I was looking for. Uh, so uh, other than those, uh, open form, anyone else like uh, have anything they'd like to talk about? All right, well, in that case, we can, looks like we're going to be able to call our e-conference early. Yes. Uh, now you did it. Uh, or, or unless somebody was talking and I froze and I didn't hear you. Okay, good. I'm just talking to myself at this point. Um, but that puts us 14 minutes early. In some case, we're going to like, we'll be early enough. We're going to have an entire e-conference that we've saved. Uh, so until next week or until tomorrow night, uh, Mark, what time? It's 8 p.m. Central. 8 p.m. Central, 9 p.m. Eastern, yeah, 7 p.m. Mountain, 6 p.m. Pacific. Uh, you can join us for the virtual hospitality suite. Mark, do we have a theme for the standard one? We do not. It is a bring your own theme week. So uh, it's 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 one long open forum. And if everybody can send, we're going to post Patty's uh, address in the chat. If you can just send her a handle of whiskey every week, that would be great. Um, <laughs> Uh, but th- th- this is nothing about Patty other than the fact that, you know, I think Patty's the best entertainment we have. <laughs> exactly. So with that, um, everybody gets unmuted, as is always the case. Thank you for coming out to eConference 11. Thank you again to Dan for uh, a great presentation, and we'll see you all next week. Bye. Bye. Bye, guys. Thanks you for too. all the love. Bye. 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 Nice to see you all. Be prepared today. <laughs> Well, he sounds sad it's over. (laughs) Yeah. Thank you. Bye, everybody.